Berlin airport of delegates to the tripartite conference. British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden alights from one of the 14 planes which bring the Anglo-American representatives to the German capital. Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson is in the U.S. delegation arriving 15th July. En route to Berlin, Mr. Stimson's plane made a long detour to enable him to see Langres, France, where he was stationed for a time in the last war. James F. Burns, who recently succeeded Edward R. Statinius as Secretary of State. The seventh plane brings in the President. He's followed from the transport by Fleet Admiral William D. Leahy as personal chief of staff. Mr. Truman flew in from Brussels after landing at Antwerp from the cruiser Augusta in which he crossed the Atlantic. The president departs for conference headquarters at Potsdam, 15 miles away, to join in talks with Prime Minister Churchill and Marshal Stalin. Mr. Truman is the first American chief executive to set foot on German soil since Woodrow Wilson's visit after World War I. The arrivals continue at the airport. General H.H. H. Arnold, chief of the Air Forces. General George C. Marshall. Highest ranking officers of Britain and Russia will attend the conference with the American Chiefs of Staff. A.P. Hill Military Reservation, Virginia. New items of signal equipment which will be available for use against Japan are demonstrated for the staff of the U.S. First Army. Major General George L. Van Dusen, Chief Engineering and Technical Service, addresses the visiting officers led by General Courtney H. Hodges. Items on display include the latest in meteorological devices. The weather balloon is equipped with a radio sound which permits measurement of atmospheric temperature, humidity, and pressure at various altitudes. These are in addition to data on wind direction and velocity. The transmitter signals are received by radio set SCR-658, which supersedes the optical method for tracking balloons and permits all-weather observation. The position of the balloon is indicated on a cathode ray tube. Sound locating set GR-6, compact magnetic tape recording equipment for determining the position of hidden enemy small arms and directing counterfire. The set employs a triangular array of buried microphones, of which this is the main component with leads to the other microphones. Azimuths are determined by measuring time differences of sound arrival between microphones. In field operation, two identical units are emplaced at the ends of a known baseline. Each measures the azimuth of sound arrival of the muzzle blast from the enemy weapon. The intersection of the two azimuth lines determines the location of the piece. The operator records his calculations. Provision is also made for rapid self-survey of the baseline and the positions of the counterfire weapons by means of sound signals. A moisture-proof switchboard measuring 12 by 3 by 1 and 1 quarter inches and weighing only 1 and a half pounds is particularly useful for jungle, mountain, amphibious, and airborne operations. Designated as SB18GT, it may be strapped to a tree as a switching center for local battery telephone lines. Properly braced in the plastic case, it becomes the operating shelf for the switchboard's seven adapter plugs, also of plastic construction. First, the field wire connection is made. Each of the plugs contains a neon lamp supervisory signal. They may also be used to substitute a visual signal for the audible ringer in field telephones.
After all connections are made, the switchboard begins operation. A lighted plug flashes the call in. The operator places his plug on top and acknowledges the call. The person called is plugged in and rung. Removing his plug, the operator awaits completion of the call. It's emphasized that because this switchboard must be watched at all times for light signals, it should not be considered as a replacement for larger audible units. SB22PT, a new portable waterproof non-positional switchboard. Suitable for Pacific warfare, it's equipped with desiccator and other weatherproof features. Sets now in the field weigh about 70 pounds, but this model has been reduced to 22 pounds. Several of the eight-line switchboards can be assembled as a unit, depending on the number of lines an operator can handle. Two lines are equipped with neon lamps to provide supervisory signals when making connections to radio sets. Next, improvements in field wire. Two men carry the old type roll for comparison with WD-1TT containing an equal length of twisted pair field wire weighing only 47 pounds per mile. Each conductor is composed of four copper and three steel strands of insulated plastic compound and covered with a nylon jacket. Demonstrating wire laying by bazooka with wire dispenser MX301G containing 3300 feet of specially wound wire. The dispenser will operate from vehicles, aircraft, pack boards, bazookas, or rifle grenades. Communication is possible over the wire while it's being laid. Liu Zhou, former U.S. 14th Air Force Base and largest communication center in South Central China, in ruins after withdrawal of Japanese forces. For a week previous to leaving, the enemy systematically burned and pillaged the town street by street, leaving the civilian population homeless. Abandoned to the Japs on the 11th of last November, Liu Zhou is recaptured by Chinese troops on 13th June. Civilians welcome the first soldiers to enter the main section of the town. The huge Liuzhou Air Base is left temporarily unusable by all but liaison planes. The Japs had dug holes in the strips for demolitions, which in some places they were unable to carry out. Refill work on these sections will place them back in use almost immediately. The end stretches of the main airstrip were blocked with empty gas drums. Craters were blown along the center section. An Air Force engineer inspects a possible booby trap on the airfield, which is heavily mined. Men of the Chinese 169th Division assemble on 2nd July for a flag-raising ceremony. A U.S. liaison officer accompanies the pack artillery. The troops are welcomed by a citizens' committee. Major General Zhao Yu Han, commanding general of the 169th Division, addresses his men. Reoccupation of Liuzhou marks the third U.S. 14th Air Force base recaptured by the Chinese. The victory also gives the Chinese full control of the Guangxi Guizhou Railroad, the first Japanese-held line to revert entirely to the Chinese. Four films of the invasion on 9th June of Agunishima, an island in the Ryukyu group. Agunishima lies 32 miles northwest of Naha. In area, it's 3.8 square miles. Troops of the 8th Regimental Combat Team advance inland against negligible opposition.
It's believed that the island's garrison was evacuated to Okinawa some time prior to the landing. Terror-stricken civilians are discovered hiding in culverts and other underground shelters. Japanese propaganda has been successful in convincing the natives that they face torture and death if they fall into our hands. The sight of a motion picture camera adds to the terror of a civilian who's been coaxed out of his hiding place. Typical of the propaganda fed these people is that which calls Americans animal-like devils bent on destroying every single Japanese they can get their hands on. This hate campaign has for its purpose the mobilization through fear of stronger zeal and greater sacrifices on the part of the civilians. To combat the intense fright built up in the minds of the natives, our psychological warfare units have increased their efforts to reach the Japanese people with leaflets. In the Okinawa campaign, these efforts attracted increasing numbers of civilians away from the battlefields and toward the safety of our lines. Native women prostrate themselves before a GI who attempts to calm their fears by offering them cigarettes. As allied pressure on the Japanese homeland increases, enemy propagandists are utilizing every means, including stories of American torture, to arouse the kamikaze spirit for defense purposes. Corps films of 13th Air Force bombers attacking Japanese coastal defense positions, oil installations, and airfields at Balikpapan on the southeast coast of Borneo. Fleets of heavy, medium, and fighter bombers drop more than 3,500 tons of bombs. The 18-day pre-invasion softening up of the rich oil area is followed by a bombardment from the U.S. 7th Fleet in conjunction with units of the Australian and Netherlands navies. After the longest aerial and naval bombardment of the Southwest Pacific fighting, infantry and armored units of the Australian 7th Division go ashore at Klandasan, the European suburb of Balikpapan. The Australians quickly establish a mile-long beachhead. The invasion is made under a pall of smoke from flaming oil tanks set on fire by Allied planes to prevent a possible flooding of the coastal waters with burning oil. Infantry moves inland, supported by Matilda tanks of the 1st Australian Armoured Regiment. 25-pound howitzers blast Jap defensive positions. The Australians advance through the eastern part of the Klandasan district, mopping up defenses in wrecked buildings. General MacArthur and Australian officers direct the operation. Against light oppositions, troops secure Paramata Ridge, dominating Balikpapan City. Oil installations are smashed by pre-invasion shelling and bombing. The destroyed cracking plant of the Royal Dutch Shell Oil Company. Capture of Balikpapan deprives the Japanese of one of their chief sources of oil, and according to General MacArthur, gives the Allies complete tactical control of the entire Southwest Pacific. Navy films show units of Admiral William F. Halsey's 3rd Fleet battling the heavy seas of a typhoon. The storm hits the fleet while it's withdrawing from a carrier strike against the Japanese home island of Kyushu. Mountainous waves whipped up by gales that reached an intensity of 138 statute miles an hour damage battleships, cruisers, aircraft, carriers and destroyers. Fisher 
seaplanes on the stern of the USS Massachusetts are wrecked on their launchers. The USS Indiana, one of the battleships hit by the storm, fights the heavy seas. The majority of the ships damaged were quickly repaired and put back in action. This is the second time in less than six months that the third fleet has been damaged by a typhoon. The first storm striking 18th December in the Philippines. Five aircraft carriers, including the Hornet, Bennington, and San Jacinto, are damaged. Planes on the deck of one of the carriers are tossed about like matchsticks by the heavy winds and by waves which reach a height of more than 100 feet. Although damage to planes and ships was extensive, only one life was lost in the storm. Hardest hit of all the ships is the cruiser USS Pittsburgh. Over 100 feet of her bow was ripped off by the high winds, but the watertight compartmentation kept the ship afloat. Sixty of the crew had living quarters in the bow section, but all were rescued when the deck plates buckled and the bow ripped off. Seaplanes on the stern deck are badly damaged. One remains on its catapult launcher while others are knocked over and wrecked on the deck. The aircraft carrier USS Bennington suffers damage to the bow of her flight deck, although the greater part of the deck is undamaged and continues to be used by her planes. The steel girders supporting the deck are bent and twisted and the wrecked section hangs over the bow. The crew of the carrier Hornet repairs damage. Planes were caught and wrecked on the flight deck when the wind renewed itself with sudden fury after it was thought to have calmed down. The primary typhoon was replaced by a secondary, more violent typhoon, and it was this second storm which battered the third fleet. The Pittsburgh, minus its bow, which was later picked up by a Navy tug, travels 900 miles to repair yards at Guam. The cruiser is put into a floating dry dock and temporarily repaired while a new permanent prefabricated bow is being built in the Bremerton Navy Yard. A temporary stub bow is put on the Pittsburgh and the cruiser heads for Puget Sound. 